when you actually have relationship with someone who's going to really see you, that's going to be uncomfortable if you're not used to seeing yourself. Oh. That's that's going to feel real personal. Like, why are they asking me all these questions? <laughs> or why, you know, you it uh, true intimacy is vulnerable. And so uh, you may find yourself saying like, why is it person after person that I'm wanting is unavailable? It may be that you're also unavailable, right? But haven't told yourself that truth. You're listening to the Redefining Wealth podcast, where we chase purpose, not money. I'm your host, Patrice Washington. I've been known as a financial expert for well over a decade, but my heart is to truly teach the masses that wealth is so much more than just talking about money and material possessions. I believe, we believe in this community in the original 12th century definition of wealth, which says it's about the condition of well-being. So each and every week, I'm here to help us unpack what I refer to as the six pillars of wealth. And today's guest whew, is here to talk about two pillars in particular. It's a combination of the people pillar, creating relationships that matter, and the faith pillar, believing in something greater. And I could not have found someone to help me personally navigate this season that I'm in, in particular, where my faith and my relationships, my intimate relationships are doing a very delicate dance. And if you identify as the strong one, in particular, a strong woman, and it feels like the weight of the world is on your shoulders right now. In so many ways, I know that you are gonna appreciate this conversation. This is gonna be good. Before we jump in, let's get into the affirmation of the week. You know, you gotta speak positivity into your life, into your day. You gotta affirm positivity. You gotta affirm abundance. You gotta affirm yourself to wealth. This week's affirmation is, I am recovering what was lost. Despite a colorful or chaotic past, I believe that I can regain possession of the things I feel were divinely assigned to me. Not just from my generation, but from generations that flow through my DNA. Loss is a part of life, but I make a conscious decision that the impact of loss does not have to be permanent. I refuse to allow scarcity to be my portion and move forward expecting my purpose to walk me straight into abundance. I am open to the relationships and resources put on my path to help me salvage what is mine skillfully, strategically, and spiritually. Declare with me today, I am recovering everything that was lost. I am so excited to welcome back a friend of the podcast. I mean, she's like my therapist in my head, Dr. Tama Bryant. She's a licensed psychologist, ordained minister, and sacred artist who has worked nationally and globally to provide relief and empowerment to marginalized persons. She's the host of the Homecoming podcast, which I have to say, every time I listen, I feel like she's a fly on the wall in my house. I don't know how she does it, but she does. It's a mental health podcast to help facilitate your journey home to self. Dr. Tama is also the author of the life altering book, Homecoming, where she helps us overcome fear and trauma to reclaim our whole authentic self. Welcome back to the Redefining Wealth podcast, Dr. Tama. Oh, thank you so much. So much love and appreciation for you. And when you held up the book, I saw all your sticky tabs. So I'm oh. glad you are really digesting it. <laughs> Dr. Tama, if I opened up this book, you would see how many pages are just oh, underlined, wow. dog tagged, all of the exercises mm -hmm. I've literally written in the margins. Yeah, I have a note section on my phone that is just dedicated ah, I love to it. the work that has come out of this book, the work yeah. that I've been 
going through. Yes. And yes. Beautiful. I have to give a backstory. You guys, Dr. Tama was actually supposed to be on season eight and I say supposed to be, but really it was all divine. All divine. Dr. Tama and I came together to record that podcast episode. And for whatever reason, all of a sudden my equipment wouldn't work. There was all this fuzziness, it, you know, every time I hit record, we tried different platforms, different things, nothing worked. And she ended up saying, I think I'm just here for you. So we could stop trying to record for the people like what's good, sis. If you remember the opening episode for season eight last year, it was the wait less season. And that was a word and a seed that Dr. Tama sold into me that day. And Dr. Tama, I just have to tell you, even virtually eyeball to eyeball, as as close as I can get directly to the camera, (laughs) you blessed me with that word. It totally shifted so much for me in terms of my level of expectation Mm. for God's acceleration Mm. in my life. Yes. And the way that I ended up sharing that with the audience, the way people have taken that mm. and have sent me the DMs and emails saying, I know Dr. Tama spoke that over you, but the way that you delivered it to us, that ripple effect. Mm. I love it. I love that it. That was just one of those moments that I couldn't keep to myself. Oh, I'm so glad you both received it and shared it. And I think often we have become so accustomed to the weight, you know, and many of us carried weights from very early in life. So we think of it as normal, like Mm -hmm. perpetual struggle, perpetual strain, perpetual warrior mode, perpetual superwoman mode, and is to release and realize I don't have to carry all of this. I'm not meant to carry all of this. Is that's freedom. Uh, It is freedom. Yeah. It is freedom. And you mentioned a homecoming is <laughs> it is dog eared. I'm surprised this cover isn't just ripped up because this <laughs> this book has been all over the country and Costa Rica. Uh, I lo- and, all right. Come yeah. on. Mm-hmm. You remember last year for my birthday, I was That's tagging right. the mess out of you. on. Yeah. <laughs> and That's no right. different. Every time I just feel myself in a place where I'm questioning my truth. Mm hmm because I'm having a conversation or I've had a conversation or an interaction with someone where they've tried to get me to justify how I feel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Something says, Mm-mm. pull right. pull out homecoming. That's it. So you guys, I can't say enough how mm-hmm. homecoming has blessed me over and over and over again. It's just mm-hmm. one of those books that I hold really close, especially mm-hmm. in this, this season. And this season, season nine of the Redefining Wealth podcast is dedicated to redefining love. Oh, beautiful. And and the first, yeah, and the first level of that. So in last week's episode, I was talking about redefining love for myself, Mm. for my God, and then for others. Beautiful. And I could not, you're the first interview of this season for that reason. Because Um, homecoming, yes. The work that you do on homecoming, Mm -hmm. let me just get into it. Cause all I I just want to hold it up and I just (laughs) Like, let me just get into it. Here's Mm -hmm. where I want to start. Some of us stayed in unhealthy relationships, not because of insecurity, but confidence. And you said confidence that you believed you could change someone and you believed your love would be enough. Mm -hmm. Those were the words I read again on the beach Mm. on my 41st birthday, which is also coincidentally the day that my divorce papers were served. Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. the realization because I struggled with the fact that I had been in years of therapy I'd had life coaches I've been so committed to personal spiritual development Mm -hmm. and all these things and so when people would say well you were staying in something that wasn't quite right for you because of your insecurity I'm like I really don't feel like Mm -hmm. it was insecurity I feel like a confident woman I feel Mm -hmm. like an empowered woman I know that I am powerful I know that I am purposeful but those words Mm -hmm. yes I I literally had (laughs) delusions of grandeur in terms of my confidence yes if I just love hard enough if I pray hard enough if I fast more often if I do all the things 
then mm-hmm. I should just continue to stay in something and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and hope for mm-hmm. something different when the reality was the things that I needed mm-hmm. in, in this season of my life were just not being honored or respected or valued. And that is the truth. Mm-hmm. It's so important that we let this other narrative be known because I think people often, as you're describing, imagine someone who is um, broken down, insecure, fragile, dependent on this person for validation. And that is the narrative for some, but there can be another narrative which is very successful women. And when you are used to being successful, then when you put your mind and heart and spirit to something, it happens in every area of your life. You like every goal I've ever had, I got it done. And so then why would relationships be any different? I'll just work harder. I'll just strategize. I'll just adjust. I'll just, I'll just, I'll just, uh, because you're not used to the way the world talks about it is quitting. The way the world talks about it is failed relationships. So if you're a successful woman, you're not going to sign up for a failed relationship. You're going to keep working until you have victory, not recognizing that leaving can be success. Yes. Right? that your permission to breathe, to exit, to not have to carry another human being emotionally and spiritually can be an act of liberation and success. Oh, I love even um, when you define homecoming in the beginning, all throughout the book, you continue to illustrate like, this is what it means to come home to yourself. But here's one part that I really loved. When I cannot be honest about how I feel and what I need or want, even with myself, I am far from home. And you go on to say, as we journey home, we recognize the ways in which we have lied to ourselves. When we have convinced ourselves that we were okay when we weren't. Mm -hmm. And then you go on to say, homecoming requires truth telling both to ourselves and to others. And one of the things that I have really learned in this last year and a half or two now is that whenever we get radically honest with ourselves, Mm -hmm. it requires us to make hard decisions. Yes. And I believe for myself and also for my clients that I've talked to and just for the women and men that I talk to in my DMs, that's the thing. Mm -hmm. Like once I get honest about how I feel and what I want, then I'm going to have to really take inventory of my life. Mm -hmm. And then what? Right. And then what? Right. Truth telling necessitates action. Right. I cannot live in the same way I could live when I was in denial. And the reality is when we talk about not knowing how we feel, if you are thriving in the other areas of your life, you weren't in touch with the misery as it related to the marriage because you were prospering professionally. You were being a great mom. You had a circle of friends. You were doing your healthy workouts. You were, so it's not like everything in your life was a disaster. So then when people would say, how are you? You would genuine, or you felt genuinely say, I'm doing great. You know, literally, literally like, and you meant it. You meant yes, it. Yes, very real in that moment. Yes, yes. And in the other areas of your life, it was true. And what ha- what can happen is you can feel like those other areas are compensating for what's missing. So you don't feel that emptiness as much. So it wasn't like you had made him your whole life. And so you weren't getting any nourishment in your life, right? Mm-hmm. So spiritually, you were getting nourished professionally, you were getting nourished and friendship. You were getting uh, nourished. You were taking care of yourself. And yet it was like to get still enough to say, what about this, which is supposed to be like my primary support, my, this supposed to be about like my number one cheerleader. This is supposed to be just, you know, that uh, soul level love uh, and that it is not flowing in the way that it should. And so it requires in some ways, even slowing down to notice that because you can make your life so full and i'm thinking of a client now who you know um just stayed so busy in parenting and 
uh, and just kind of missed it, like missed what was missing because of being like super busy. Mm -hmm. And so when you slow down and then begin to tell yourself the truth that this is, it's not enough. And it also is costing me, right? Yeah, it's costly. It's costly to be dishonest with ourselves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it, when, when you ask yourself or when other people ask you, how could it go on so long? Well, one, you were working at it and two, you were prospering in other areas. So it didn't feel as the cut, like you didn't realize you were bleeding. Yeah, it's right? like just a little little paper cut. It's right. Not a, it wasn't like a I didn't get stabbed to death. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes. Like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. And um, then, you know, being a positive person, you affirm yourself. So you make a decision like when they say like joy is a decision. Right. So you would wake up in the morning and say it's a new day. I'm going to have a great day. <laughs> See, Dr. Tama, I'm telling you, she stays a fly on the wall. This is how I feel when I listen to your podcast. I'm like, how does she know? Uh. know? (laughs) That's exactly it. You know, looking back, I even did a a product at one time that was very, very popular in my business. And it was called Affirm Yourself to Wealth. Mm -hmm. And yes, I have lived with these positive affirmations and the really this belief that nothing bad is happening to me which we could get into, like nothing bad is happening to me. Everything is like a lesson or a blessing. So really, when I look back, Mm -hmm. I realized from the book in particular, how disconnected I was to my actual emotions. And one of the things that I took away from your book about how we even lose our way home Mm -hmm. to begin with Mm -hmm. is that like many people, I was raised to dismiss my feelings. Mm -hmm. And in the book you talk about, we dismiss our feelings because of sometimes religion or, um, you know, based on certain teachings around our gender, Mm -hmm. our race and and all these different things. And in that part of the book, when I tell you that thing is underlined and I started to list some of the reasons that I had normalized behavior that didn't feel good. Mm -hmm. And just, I literally just, it, if you can normalize, I think that we can normalize toxicity. Yeah, becomes the norm. Yeah. And, and you, uh, you adjust to it and it's no longer startling, right? So then, you know, as one survivor um, of, of uh, intimate partner violence talked about was she didn't know when this had become the norm, mm. right? And because it's, you know, the initial time, it's like, oh, my God, did you just say that to me? Or did you just do that? Or like, wait, what just happened? And um, when you have that frame that you described, which is everything's a lesson or blessing, you don't have time to tend to the really the wound and the fact that we are worthy of having intimate space where we're not constantly being wounded. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, But that becomes, you know, that's sometimes when we spiritualize, then uh, we can miss what's actually happening. Can we talk about that? I I know you and I have talked about that, like off the mic um, before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I've shared is when I did question behavior Mm -hmm. over the years, we would always look to faith based, namely Christian counselors. Yeah. and pastors. Mm-hmm. And looking back, I genuinely feel like I was manipulated yeah. into staying mm-hmm. and into working on, you know, my belief in God, my trust in God, which is what I, you know, I've always continued to do. And I talk about my faith openly here in the podcast and on stage and all of those things. Yeah. But I feel like in a way it was weaponized mm-hmm. to put up with behavior and that I just needed to pray about it and I needed to stay, you know, committed to the marriage, but I don't feel like there was always a true sense of accountability for him, Mm -hmm. even though the actions were his. Yes. Yeah. 
This is so important. The manipulation is real and it is when uh, ministers and other people are prioritizing longevity of the relationship over the wholeness of the individuals, right? So they don't care that you're miserable as long as we keep counting these years, 10 years, 15 years, 20, and we, you know, give a big cheer, even if both the people are miserable, because they'll even say, well, you know, you you not, you don't have to be happy. I've you know, heard people say, it's not about, that's the, that's, I'm like, that's the world. <laughs> the world wants us to be happy. And God is like, it's okay if you're miserable. So uh, it's interesting that you would uh, be able to identify the manipulation. And interestingly, I have even had people who were on the other side of things. I'm thinking um, about a client who's a husband who talked about being uncomfortable. He had um, cheated uh, many times on his wife and they went to the pastoral counseling and he sat there and watched the pastor basically bully her into quote unquote forgiving and staying. And, you know, they left the office, but he, he knew it wasn't right. Mm. Right. Even though he benefited from it. Right. So, um, we have to be very, very careful about, you know, who is in our ears and as you name, um, how people can weaponize your faith to uh, have you spend your whole life in something that is destroying you. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to touch on what it looks like to be wandering, mm -hmm. to not be at home to yourself and to be disconnected because as we started with you know, I think people have a picture of everybody just being down and out and depressed and all these things. And it can look and manifest this, itself in so many different ways. Yeah. Can you just give us some ideas of how we would, what we might identify with if we are just not home to ourselves? Yeah. So one of the ones that's often overlooked is the busyness, right? Because it looks productive, right? It is productive. And, you know, we live in a capitalist society and people will praise you, especially if you work for a company, they will praise you to be the first one there and the last one to leave, you know, and doing all the extra hours and signing up for everything. And, you know, we're even in a, in a culture now where people frown on if you have a hobby that you have not turned into a stream of income. <laughs> Right. I've seen like, that. Yes. You know, it's like, are you how are you, are you making money off of that? And it's like, no, I just love to do it. But um, so that perpetual busyness can also be I can't be still because if I am still and silent, I'll have to face some things. I'll have to think about some things. I'll be overwhelmed by some things. So let me just keep moving. Some people are also afraid if they got still, they would never be able to move again because they've been stuffing that stuff for so long. So um, hyper busyness can be a, a form of that. It also is in, you know, what we use to numb ourselves. And we can often frown at people if we say, oh, they're overusing uh, alcohol or drugs. Um, but there are many things we can overuse, including these cell phones, right? That social media is designed to be addictive. That's why they want to give you constant notifications. Something happened. Somebody liked something. Somebody said something. Come look again. Look again. Look again. You looked at one reel. Now another reel is going to appear. So uh, you can spend hours of your life numbed out uh, being a spectator in other people's lives. And uh, we can also use food. Uh, we can use gossip. We can use obsessions with uh, celebrities. Uh, so there are all kinds of things that are uh, distractions and that uh, serve to numb us. Mm -hmm. And so looking at uh, what are the things that I turn to, you know, what are the things that I rely on and is it actually something that is nourishing me? Mm -hmm. uh, it can also show up as um, emotional of unavailability, right? Because that's why sometimes we can be drawn to people who are emotionally unavailable because when you actually have relationship with someone who's gonna really see you, 
that's going to be uncomfortable if you're not used to seeing yourself. Ooh. That's that's going to feel real personal. Like, why are they asking me all these questions? <laughs> or why, you know, you it uh, true intimacy is vulnerable. And so uh, you may find yourself saying like, why is it person after person that I'm wanting is unavailable? It may be that you're also unavailable, right? But haven't told yourself that truth. Oh, that's so good. I remember when you talked about some of the distractions, um, it was a, a part of like the coping Mm-hmm. how we can cope with disconnect yeah. and what and so I want to give some kind of things to consider um mm-hmm. when we talk about I think you called it emotion focused coping mm-hmm. um and so that I because I remember writing out a list doctor you know I turned my phone off before but you know I have that li- I have all my lists <laughs> <laughs> in my notes section of my phone Love because it. it was about um like instead of the distractions kind of leaning into the activities that can help soothe, but like in a more um, productive or healthy way. So Mm -hmm. I remember like journaling Mm -hmm. um, for me, meditating, uh, working out, but not to the point of making it a distraction because working out is uh, some people can take it there to an extreme Um, Mm -hmm. talking to friends. Can we talk about Mm -hmm. what it looks like to, I guess, get on the path, um, to coping with, with Mm -hmm. life instead of just leaning into the distractions? Right, right. No, great question. Uh, So there's basically three general types of coping. So there's emotion focused coping, problem solving, coping and distraction. And at different points, you may need to use all three. You're just looking at like, are there pieces I'm neglecting because I am over focused on one, right? So with the distraction in a healthy way, it's some people ruminate which is they just keep replaying it over and over and over again and they every time you talk to them you're talking about their ex and everything is just like Mm -hmm. so centered on that and so sometimes you have to give like your heart a break give your mind a break give yourself a break and say like okay you know tomorrow i'm gonna go to the movies or you know i'm gonna do something else i'm gonna have lunch with a friend and that is not going to be the topic of the conversation so giving yourself that mental break um, can be a form of coping emotion focused coping are uh, the things that you do to help acknowledge express and soothe the distress so um, that's as you name the journaling Um, If there are people who I can talk to about, you know, what I'm feeling and they support me, uh, not judging me, uh, using my expressive arts. Uh, So some people, especially uh, creative artists, will say like their best poem or their best choreography came, you know, out of their heartbreak and they like put it into the art. And that was like a form of relief and empowerment. Uh, we can also use our spiritual practices, so meditation or prayer, uh, reading an inspirational text. Um, and so uh, we want to think about what do I do to calm my emotions, aromatherapy, taking a bath, massage, uh, all of those things help emotionally. Uh, and then we have problem solving coping. So that is what am I going to do about it? Right. Mm-hmm. So you know, whether that was the filing of divorce or going to couples counseling um, or us coming up with some compromise because you wanted to do this and I wanted to do this. And now, like, what are we going to do? So one of the things that's helpful for us to be mindful, what are we looking for when we express our distress to somebody? And if we know what we're looking for, to let them know that, because sometimes what happens is, we're really wanting like a hug and a soft place to land. And somebody's trying to tell you about, well, when it was, if it was me, blah, blah, blah. And they tell you seven things you need to do and what you shouldn't do. And you're like, I wasn't looking for all of that. I'm going to make my own decision. Right. And then sometimes it's the flip where, um, you know, somebody's trying to rub your back and you're like, I'm not looking for a back rub. I need a strategy. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, check in with yourself and also notice if you usually lean towards one and neglect a- another, because some people are like, I'm about solutions, but they never give themselves space to cry. Right. Or some people have been crying and crying 
and need to come up with a plan, right? So oh. see, yeah, where do you lean? Oh, that is so good. Now, I know you are loving the Redefining Wealth podcast, but do you know what would take it up a notch? It's if you invested in a copy of my brand new book, Redefine Wealth for Yourself, How to Stop Chasing Money and Finally Live Your Life's Purpose. Now on the podcast, you hear me talk about the six pillars of wealth every single week. That's fit, people, space, faith, work, and money. And I want you to incorporate this into your life. But let's be honest, the podcast isn't enough. I poured 114 lessons from my own life, the rituals, the mindsets, the behaviors, the attitudes that I had to shift in order to redefine wealth for myself in each one of these pillars. And now I've made it available to you. So you can make sure to pick up your copy in paperback, hardcover, or even listen on Audible. Whatever you do, make this a part of your library today. You know, for many years, Dr. Tama, and we may have talked about this um, the last time you were on the podcast, we talked about, you know, being raised by people who didn't necessarily have the luxury of healing. Yeah. And I've come back to this with different therapists <laughs> multiple times throughout the years because it is hard for me to cry. Mm -hmm. I can sit and think through any matter of things, any number of things, but the tears that I've even cried throughout my separation and divorce, honestly, when I cried in the shower, it was like really tears of gratitude. Like it wasn't from sadness, mm -hmm. but when I did finally cry, there was like a, whoo, girl, you free. <laughs> like mm -hmm. it was a, there were like tears of joy Sweet. almost. Yeah. And I, I mean, I don't want to, trivialize anything or make it seem like it wasn't a difficult season but it was not like a sobbing of like oh my god you know when I did feel something the way that I process a part of that is meditation reading reading things positive or just like to get more knowledge on something I suppose and journaling mm -hmm. and I used to always and I still struggle with this sometimes I want to ask people so I'm gonna ask you today is mm -hmm. something wrong with me because I don't cry if I necessarily feel sad mm -hmm. I'm just I'm just able to sit with it and and intellectually move through it and I'm like emotionally what the heck yeah. So there's a defense mechanism called intellectualizing. Mm. Right. So, you know, you keep it in your head. Um, and so it's not as much that something is wrong is that um, you have limited yourself. You, you have cut off access to parts of your experience. And um, when you have been in a long term unhealthy circumstance, um, you can adopt that mindset because, and I, you know, I don't know the, the details, but perhaps emotion wasn't welcome there or emotion didn't feel safe there. So you adjusted. Mm. So now that you're no longer in that circumstance, it's time to bring your heart back. And the way we can, uh, we say like drop into our heart is to be able to um, utilize more body-based interventions so if you do like cognitive therapy that's going to keep you in your head and that's where you like it's like i'm gonna think of this and think and change my thought and da, da, da. Mm -hmm. uh, but to tap into the emotion uh like trauma-informed yoga um or like uh dance african dance praise dance um or somatic psychotherapy soma means body so as you connect with your body more you will uh, animate your heart. You'll 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 wake it up. Oh, mm. that is so good. Yeah. And I I genuinely, as I'm listening to you say that, I think about that starting when I was a kid. Mm. So you know, being raised in a in a home, I'm Belizean American, but being raised by my grandma who would, you know, give you the fix your face speech. Like there was no room no, to no. have a problem with anything. Like there was no room to feel sad, even if something was actually a sad occurrence. There yeah. was no room to respond mm -hmm. any type of emotion. 
Yeah. So that was a setup. You know, I mean, they taught us what they knew, but it was a setup. And I want to name even a setup in your marriage, um, because I think I, I, you're pretty transparent here. But one of the things that we discussed before is your partner having no idea, like the depth of your despair. And so when we are perpetually intellectualizing and masking, it, it makes it a secret from us, but also a secret from the people we are in relationship with. And so that's how behavior can, you know, continue because, you know, you're not looking phased by it. And you can say, like, I didn't feel like I was pretending or performing. It's the, it is the way, here it is, when we were made to be that way from, from so young, we can convince ourselves that's just how I am, right? Mm -hmm. But it's how you were made to be from a very young age, but it's not how you have to continue to be so that in your relational life and just for yourself going forward, that I want to give myself permission for the full range of human emotion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Something else that connects to that is I in my marriage not not even like honoring what I felt like was true. Like so you're talking about that emotion, that mm -hmm. emotional place, but also just like questioning mm -hmm. myself for things that I knew were true for me. Yes. That makes sense. Yes. Right. Yeah. So in, in the book, you, you say you, there's a declaration and it says, I refuse to participate in the silencing of myself. Mm -hmm. I do not consent to the erasing of myself. Yeah. And there was something like that left out. Like mm -hmm. it, that stood out to me so much because I realized that I silenced myself in the marriage as vocal as I am and is like oh I could be on stage and I could do this and yeah. then not for my sanity not to be questioned I just I'm not even going go round and around with you but that did not start there mm -hmm. I learned to silence myself yeah. at home I actually grew up in a home with a grandmother that did not like noise mm -hmm. so there was always this be quiet, be quiet. Then I go to school, you talk too much, be quiet, be mm. quiet. And so once I got older, professionally speaking, yeah. I understood the importance of commanding the stage and owning your voice. And only since separation and divorce have I made the connection that I could do that professionally, but not always personally. Yes, yes. So uh, important. One, the setup, which is why it no alarm went off when you had to do it in the marriage, right? You're like, of course, this is what relationship, this is what love looks like, right? This is what love looks like. Is I love them enough that I want them to be comfortable and I can tell they're uncomfortable when I'm expressing. So I'll be quiet. Mm -hmm. Ooh, you know, as I start to move on and dream a new dream. Yeah. I have to say, you know, so funny. I had this episode when I announced my separation last March, <laughs> the episode was called dream a new dream. And sometime around there, you had an episode on daring to dream again. And I was like, <laughs> Dr. Tama, leave me alone. Like out of my closet. <laughs> it was, it was also connected. Oh, and so, you know, as I continue to heal, I mean, I still have the desire to date and love again and, yes. and see something different for my life. Yeah. But I will say um, what I have taken away from your book, and it's another note I keep in my phone, you say our minds can sometimes convince us to ignore or minimize our concerns. Yeah. And just in the brief dating <laughs> yes. I have attempted to do at this <laughs> point, when I feel that my feelings are not being validated. Yeah. I have learned that I feel it in my body. Mm, like I do feel that like this doesn't feel right or this yeah. doesn't feel good for me. And I have learned that 
I don't have to over explain and rationalize and be logical. And, and because period point blank, this mm-hmm. doesn't feel right. I'm telling you, it doesn't feel right for me. Yeah. And if the response is combative mm-hmm. and defensive, I'm like, yeah, I don't have oh, okay. to. This. Yeah, this looks like labor. This looks like a workshop. This feels like a client. This is work, right? <laughs> and that's not the kind of work that when we say, oh, relationships take work, not this kind of work. So mm-hmm. um, it's it's a great realization and awareness Mm -hmm. of your own healing because with healing not only will you select differently your taste will be different but also you will show up differently and so you start to recognize those old patterns say i don't want to sign up for that again i i know how to do that but at this season of my life that's that's not what i'm signing up for well, Dr. Tama, can I tell you what one joker told me? Yes, I use no. joker loosely. I, I love joker. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, it's a, yeah, it's a very mild. <laughs> so one joker told me when I expressed, like, I've seen this before. Like, this is a pattern that I'm not willing to revisit with anybody at this stage in my life and this stage of my healing. Mm-hmm. And he essentially said, you're going to go around putting what your ex did on everybody. And he's like, I don't know what you're over there doing in therapy. They're not helping you. How do you know? For me, I was like, Joker, get out of here. So that was done. But mm-hmm. how would someone know yeah. that they are healing if they are actually healing because they recognize those patterns or if they're just projecting some old stuff on a new situation, a new partnership, a new relationship. Right. So uh, it would be to identify the actual behavior or to identify what was actually said. Right. Because, um, you know, one of the things when you have been hurt, you can just be hyper vigilant and not trust anybody, even when people haven't given you a reason to. Right. So you're like making assumptions or accusing people of things they haven't actually done versus identifying a behavior that is problematic in and of itself, right? So that's what you wanna, not only do I have a feeling, while we do wanna get to a place where we can trust our intuition, initially that alarm might be going off off nonstop just because of uh, the the discomfort and the fear of a repeat, Mm -hmm. but then to say, If I look at it in isolation, what did they say or what did they specifically Mm -hmm. do? That's that is how I will know um, if if it's projection or if it is manifestation is showing up in real Mm -hmm. life. Yeah, I knew this one was showing up. Dr. Tim was was. very clear. (laughs) (laughs) And then for him to try to uh, criticize your your therapy and That's also a good indicator for you, uh, for any of us, when people can't take feedback, Mm -hmm. right? Because even knowing you the way that, uh, to the extent I know you, I know the way it was communicated was not like attacking, accusatory. I I already know that you said it in a way where uh, anybody who was grounded could hear it, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, and then could have been able to talk about it, even if they were to say, we know the difference between intention and impact. Even if they were to say, you know, when I said that, you know, I didn't mean to be blah, 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 but I can see how it would feel like that. Yes. And I, you know what I mean? that You can tell when people can reflect and own, even if it's a partial ownership, right? Then we can, we can have some some ground right um but when not only do i absolutely reject what you're saying but now i'm going to uh, insult you (laughs) and and make it about your issues because you've had uh negative people in the past so you're not ready for me it's like oh is that is that what care sounds like yeah Yeah. Yeah. I was like, you know, thinking about this goes back to that idea that you think that I was in a long-term marriage with these issues because of insecurity. Mm -hmm. 
it was not insecurity. The way yeah. that I learned to love was, oh, you just work with people and fix them yeah. and you just yeah. hope and pray yeah. for the you best. People. It yeah. wasn't because I was insecure for all those years. So don't, don't right. try me, sir. Don't, yes. Don't, don't play with me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and with that, <laughs> it's it's over. It's and with that, I bless and release you right, um, yeah. back into the wild. So, yeah. but <laughs> Dr. Tamas, so we've been kind of talking about more romantic love, but I also wanted to, you know, make the connection to purpose um, because, you know, we're all about chase purpose, not money. And I think sometimes we see these conversations about coming home to yourself, just about our personal relationships, but there's really a space in the book where I think you make a, do a great job of just also under helping us understand professionally what this looks like. Mm -hmm. Um, Because one of the things you said is if you have spent seasons of your life chasing goals that really did not matter to you, that did not fulfill you, this is another manifestation of being emotionally homesick. And so there are people who are donning some incredible titles and they have beautiful office spaces and they have, uh, you know, reserved parking (laughs) And they have all the labels and they've literally built a life that they don't want and is not fulfilling them. That's right. And they're, they feel completely out of alignment. Can we just speak to also what some of that looks like? Cause maybe personally we're the opposite. Maybe personally you are doing your thing, but professionally mm-hmm. you and outwardly, actually you're not really where you truly authentically desire to be. Right. That's right. And so we can think about, you know, what we made the decision based on. So uh, some people culturally grew up in households where like you were only allowed to become like an engineer, doctor or lawyer. You know, I've had students who undergraduate students who have asked me to talk to their family because they want to major in psychology. And the family is like, what's that? Right. Um, So sometimes it was uh in some ways they felt they didn't get to decide that other people decided for them. Uh, sometimes people decided based on the money, right? Of mm-hmm. Like, I wanna make a good living and this makes the most. Um, so mm-hmm. this is what I'm gonna do. Uh, and then sometimes people um, think because they can do something, they should do something. And you want to- Dr. Tama, break that down. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Some people think because I can do it, I should do it. Uh, So just because you're good at something doesn't mean it's good to you or good for you, right? And other people may have been so amazed you're good at it that they made it seem like, well, that's what you're supposed to do. Even though you don't actually like it, it just comes easy to you. So the gifting of the time we're living in is so many people are having a second or third career. I have graduate students who, you know, are middle age and they did another career for a number of years and then either now decided they wanted to go into mental health or it's always been the secret dream and they saved up some and now they're ready to do it. Um, But as we both said, to give yourself permission to dream a new dream or to revive the old dream, Uh, because we spend a lot of hours working. Yes. I mean, that's like a lifetime. Yes. So you don't want to just dismiss that uh, if and when you have options. I do know, you know, some people will say, um, you know, my family is dependent on me. and, and, And in those cases, you know, I ask people to think creatively about how can I protect time and energy to build the dream while I am having stability to pay my family's bills. Um, And then hopefully as we continue to plant those seeds in the dream, that it could get to a place where it could be the main thing. Um, But, you know, we're strategic and planful for that. Absolutely. We talk about that in my program, Purpose to Platform. Like sometimes what you're working on is even just volunteering. You're doing it in a volunteer situation, but so that you can start to see what's possible for it. And that also helps kind of nourish your soul and like makes it okay to continue to do the thing that you're doing in this season, but also creates like a little gateway to down to the path of purpose. Um, Dr. Tame, I have to say, what I love about homecoming is that it makes it okay to not heal overnight. Mm-hmm. The more I read the book, 
you know, every time I'm reading it, every time I flip to it, Mm -hmm. I've been exposed to something new. I'm different. I've had new, you know, um, revelation, fresh revelation about something and things just continue to open up. So I respect how it is laid out because it allows me to just embrace that healing is a journey. Right. And I have no expectation of myself to just heal overnight. Like, okay, girl, like back to my positive thinking, like it's a lesson <laughs> or a blessing. I'm moving on. No, I am learning new things about myself every single day. I'm learning new things about my history, not just myself today, but how that relates. And I wanted to say that because as I look back over the last several years, I realized how I've been coming home for a while now Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and coming home professionally kind of first allowed me to get out of the box of just being the finance expert Mm -hmm. because that was the label. That's what the accolades were attached to. That's what all the stuff was. And I had these media platforms I was attached to and all this notoriety, but I knew internally that I wanted to say more. Mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to share more. I always felt this sense of like, but I I feel like I could help people in different ways, even though it doesn't fit into the box of how I've been labeled. Mm -hmm. And so starting to come home to that did build my confidence. Mm. It did help me to see what my impact really could be. It did fulfill me on a different level because the conversations I was having with people was no longer just about budgets and credit reports. It felt so much deeper and it was so much more nourishing. Mm -hmm. And then exploring my faith. Mm -hmm. I talked to you about that offline (laughs) one time too, like just exploring my faith, coming home in that way, allowing me to see what I believe without just subscribing to, well, this is what I was born into. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, exploring my acceptance of other faiths. That's Mm -hmm. what I love about this community. And I love about you is that you can speak to so many different faith backgrounds Mm -hmm. And you're just always so gracious and loving and embracing and kind and knowledgeable. You literally are like my, you're like my, I guess I would say mentor in that way that I just desire for my community to feel loved no matter what, you know, our faith of origin is, our religion of origin Mm -hmm. is. And, and that expansion. Yeah allow me to come home to myself in a different way. And, and then it led to the, the, the marital stuff. Mm-hmm. Like it just, it's amazing that I look over the journey, how things just become intolerable, but, but that frustration is such an invitation. But I'll just say, it's so true that healing is an ongoing journey. And so it's for us not to beat ourselves up when new experiences show the wound in a new way. Uh, It doesn't mean we haven't done any work. It means I'm in a new season. So for example, even around the relationship, a part of your healing takes place uh, as a single person inward. And then a part of the healing won't really happen until you're in relationship, Mm -hmm. right? Because you can feel like in the abstract, we say like, I'm good, I'm fine, I feel wonderful. But when I actually have to show up for somebody, uh, then it's gonna bring up some new pieces. Uh, when your child gets to be the age you were when significant things happen, yeah, some stuff will show up for you, you know? So when you branch out into these new spaces, and as you said, when people try to make you question uh, your reality, gaslighting and these kinds of things, those are triggers because, you know, you've had that experience before. So it is a continuous journey. And um, and as you named, it affects the different areas of our lives, uh, romantically, friendship, professionally, spirituality. And the big piece, you know, in all of this is uh, defining it for ourselves instead of being limited to the boxes that other people try to put us in. Right. Like you said, if the box Mm -hmm. is finance, then I can't talk about spirituality. Who said, right? But that's the, those are the rules. And then I get to decide, are those my rules, right? Or am I gonna be out of the box? Yeah. Uh, I am really learning to embrace this out of the box living. I'm really learning to embrace and loving it actually. Beautiful. Allowing myself to see a different possibility. Mm -hmm. Um, That has actually helped me so much professionally. I have to say it is like 
up level my business in ways I never thought about. But uh-huh. I see that that asking better questions almost, but also like mm-hmm. deeper questions and yeah. giving myself more permission that if you question that, then you can question this and you're allowed mm-hmm. to question this and you're allowed to question this and explore for yourself. Mm-hmm. And I think that is all a part of what it means to redefine wealth. Mm-hmm. Um, so, oh my gosh. Okay. Even though I asked you before, before I let you go, I'm going to ask you again, these redefining wealth rapid wisdom questions. Just okay. tell us the first thing that comes to mind. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you define success, Dr. Tama? Utilizing all of my gifts to the point of fulfillment. How do you define wealth in three words or less? Abundance and overflow. What's one book that has helped you redefine wealth for yourself? Daughter Drink This Water by Dr. Jaya John. Oh, this is a first. Mm -hmm. Daughter Drink This Water. Okay, we'll link to that in the show notes, you guys. Okay, and fill in the blank. My name is, and to me, the truth about wealth is. My name is Tama Simone. And for me, the truth about wealth is it, it, the truth about wealth is the goal is collective liberation, not an individual story. Dr. Tama, always a pleasure. Oh, thank you for for having me. I so enjoy um, it every time. Oh my gosh, Dr. Tame, if I could just bottle you up. I just I <laughs> you make me want to move back to LA so Girl, that, that I that would be, be so great. Client just so I could sit at your feet. Thank you, thank you, thank you for how you always pour in. Thank you for the gift of the homecoming podcast. Thank you for the gift of this book that just continues to stretch me and hold me and encourage me and support me through um, this this phase of just learning to love myself on a deeper level, but also just learning, I think, to to love God on a deeper level, to love others on a deeper, le- deeper level, because it all comes from a very authentic place, as authentic as it can be on any given day in that moment. And I'm learning to just love that and accept that and embrace that mm-hmm. each day with, oh, with, without you- judgment. Without judgment. I love it. Each day. Each day. That's a gift. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Dr. Tama. You are welcome. Hey, you guys, I hope you were blessed by this episode. Go out and get a copy of Homecoming if you don't have it already. I know I've talked about it. I've shared it in the stories. I'll talk about it until I don't know when. I'll just keep talking about it because I absolutely love, love, love this book, the way it's written, the heart that it's written with. I'm telling you, you will not be disappointed. Um, Join me next week as we just keep digging deeper into this whole idea of what it means to redefine love for ourselves, for our God, and for others. This entire season is dedicated to it. You do not want to miss this lineup. So if you're not subscribed to the podcast, please go ahead and subscribe. Don't forget to rate and review. Connect with Dr. Tama in social media. Dr. Tama, what's your Instagram handle? Dr. Dr. Period Tama, T-H-E-M-A. Oh, go get you some of these good nuggets at Dr. Dot, at Dr. Dot Tama on Instagram. Get your whole life um, and follow her work in her podcast. She's absolutely incredible. And I'll be back next week. Remember until then to go live your life's purpose, find fulfillment and keep earning more without feeling like you have to chase money. I'll talk to you later. Bye.